The work of natural selection is classically illustrated by the finches Darwin found on the Galapagos Islands. There are some 13 species, all with different beaks. Yet these varieties all evolved from one ancestral species which arrived from the mainland with one type of beak. One now behaves like a woodpecker using a cactus spine to hunt for grubs. Another now feeds on ticks living on giant tortoises. While a third, the vampire finch, feeds on the blood of seabirds. These are all activities requiring different types of beak. Natural selection is about survival. The beaks changed because the changes helped the finches to survive. And there wasn't a designer in sight. When Darwin first explained evolution by natural selection, many people either wouldn't or couldn't grasp it. I myself flatly refused to believe it when I first heard it as a child. For Darwin's theory to succeed, it had to explain both the wonderful variety of nature and its astonishing complexity. It does both with the utmost elegance. My colleague George McGavin has devised an experiment to show how natural selection works in practice. It explains how insects acquire their camouflage. They do it tiny bit by tiny bit. What we've got here is a, an artificial woodland floor on which I've placed a variety of insects. Some of the insects are very easy to see. Some of the insects are not so easy to see, and a few of them are extremely hard to see. OK, what I want you to do is to pretend you're in a woodland, OK? And it's sort of darkish, OK? And you're, you're hungry birds, OK? And you're hunting for insects to eat. So if you see anything which you might want to eat, you can say, I can see an insect. Right. Who can see an insect? Me! Right. How many can you see? Four, uh, three, two. Three. Two? I can't see any. The children play the role of predators. They show that even a little camouflage gives an insect some advantage, so long as its predators don't get too close. I think I saw some. No. How, how about that one there? On I the saw that one. What's that? I saw that one. A caterpillar. A caterpillar. No one spotted that, that one. one. No one spotted that one. No, that's the last I one. Did, I did, I spotted that one, but I just forgot. If you're obvious, your chances of being eaten are very high, and therefore over time, small changes which make you not so obvious will be selected and will be passed on. And so at the end of thousands of years of evolution, the end result will be, or ought to be, an insect which is extremely well hidden in its background. The success of those hidden insects shows how natural selection rewards even tiny changes. The process of natural selection explains how simple structures over millions of years eventually evolved into complex, astonishing creatures like the dinosaurs. Or us. But natural selection is not some kind of awards ceremony where nature applauds interesting new genetic mutations. It's not nature's fashion show. It's a competition to the death. Each individual within every species competes in the harsh, even bloodthirsty real world for access to resources and for opportunities to reproduce. Natural selection is all about living long enough to pass on your genes. Darwin realized that wild animals compete to survive. More are born than the food supply can sustain. Inevitably, many die young or otherwise fail to reproduce. Amidst this widespread slaughter, every animal fights a relentless battle for survival. In the natural struggle for existence, some variants were better at surviving than others, and they passed their good qualities on to the future. Natural selection explains how we got to where we are now. But does it also suggest to you 
a dark and troubling answer to the question why we are here. Natural selection suggests that we, like all other animals, are survival machines. We are here only to compete long enough to pass on our genes. This seems to be the purpose of our lives, the reason we are here. But can this really be the only purpose of human existence? I don't think so. Darwin's remarkable theory offers a second meaning of the word purpose. It's an inspiring one, which accords more fully with our own view of our better selves. It stems from the curious observation that we humans appear to be breaking Darwin's rules. Human behavior in the 21st century seems to have nothing to do with the brutal world of natural selection. Evolution may explain how humans came into the world, but it doesn't shed much light on the way we lead our lives today. Most of our energy goes into projects that seem nothing to do with the goals of survival or reproduction. We neither feel nor act as though we are driven by evolutionary compulsion. We seem to have freed ourselves from the need to spend all our time propagating our selfish genes. We have many other goals that take our time and energy. We explore the world around us create objects for their aesthetic beauty. Pursue hobbies for the sake of fun. And when we have sex, we defy our genes with contraception. If only they could think, our genes would be aghast at all this. I personally am delighted that our big brains gave us the freedom to defy our selfish genes. The unrefined world of natural selection is not the sort of world I want to live in. The beauty and purposeful elegance of living creatures like cheetahs and gazelles is bought at huge cost in the blood and suffering of countless ancestors on both sides. But if the ultimate purpose of our existence is the narrowly Darwinian one of propagating our genes, how can we defy them? Ironically enough, the things that freed us from our genes were also the result of natural selection. And it all began millions of years ago in Africa.